so patient with us. Our lives are filled with many choices and many challenges. And thank you for choosing to be here this morning. I welcome you. We uh, trust that this service will be a blessing to each of you. Um, I want to express my deep appreciation for the uh, wonderful after church dinner and uh, birthday wishes. Uh, I didn't know all that was going on last week, but uh, thank you for blessing me. You know, those cards and the cake and the pies and all that, that was wonderful. So thank you, each of you. I had a, a really beautiful birthday week with my family the week before. This is my youngest grandson. And whenever he's there, he asks me, Papa, can I go for a ride? And so I have a, my smaller scooter that I take him on pretty much every day and give him a little ride around the driveway. And you can see how much, I don't know which one of us likes it more. <laughs> uh, and then we had a beautiful birthday party. And there's my a little grandson in front, my daughter Desi behind. And, uh, my other grandson Cameron behind Michelle and uh, Michelle and little Phil were having a moment. They were giggling and laughing. Uh, thank you. And uh, as we look ahead to upcoming birthdays for uh, Luke and Lynn and Peggy and Sue, we'll just be celebrating each of you in the very near future and your birthdays. And uh, soon we're going to be starting a uh, regular Bible study, and I look forward to that. This morning I want to. Uh, invite you to uh, follow along and read the scripture with me. I think I have it here. Okay. Would you uh, do something with me here? Would you stand and read this together in unison? So would you stand together and we'll read this together. John chapter 7 verses 1 through 17. Just in honor of his word, we'll read this in unison today. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee purposely staying away from Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, Show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore, Jesus told them, My time is not yet here, for you any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not yet going up to the festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival of the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, Where is he? Among the crowds there was widespread whispering about him, some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Now until halfway through the festival, did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get on such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Amen. You may be seated. That's challenging to read those, so uh, maybe I'll, next time I'll do it responsibly so it's a little easier. But thank you. Reading it. Letting it come through your eyes, your eye gate, into your mind, and thinking about it. And I just ask that the Lord will use this time to really bring these words uh, to us. This morning I want to continue our walk through the Gospel of John. And this Gospel helps anyone to find faith in the Lord Jesus. And John is telling us what he has seen, what he's personally witnessed, 
uh, as an eyewitness and specific examples of what he calls signs or evidences that Jesus was the Messiah. And we've been walking this journey through now for a couple of months, and we, we started with the baptism, Jesus' baptism by John, and we saw the first sign where Jesus changed the water into wine in Cana, and then we saw that Jesus went down to Jerusalem and he cleared the temple, revealing his, uh, his authority as the Messiah. Uh, there he met with Nicodemus that night. Nicodemus wanted to understand uh, about him. He knew that this man was performing miracles, and he understood that he had come from God, and there Jesus uh, gave the explanation of why he had come, to seek to save the lost, and those who believe in him could have eternal life. And following that, we saw that Jesus went through Samaria. He met with this woman at the well, a Samaritan woman who uh, had lived a sinful life. But Jesus came to her bringing an offer of salvation. She went and told everyone she knew that there was a great revival of new believers there in Samaria. Jesus returned from Samaria on through to Galilee and to Canaan. There he was met by a man. And we have another sign where Jesus healed this uh, ruler, this royal official. Uh, of his son that was near death, Jesus told him, your son will live, and the uh, disciples saw another great miracle. Jesus then went back to another feast in Jerusalem, and there he went to the pool of Bethesda, and he healed the man who had been playing for 38 years, and uh, a great healing, another sign, this uh, third sign, the healing of the cripple. And then we followed the, the fourth sign, where Jesus went back to Galilee, and there he fed 5,000 men plus women and children uh, with just a few loaves and fishes. Just amazing miracles. And then we, last week, we talked about how Jesus said, as the people were chasing him down, wanting more bread, he said, I am the bread of life. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. If you will believe in me, you will live. That's where we left off last week, and now we continue on in chapter 7. Chapter 7. It's about timing. It's about choices. Choices. We all make dozens of choices every day. Jesus knows the time. He shows us the way. You've already made many choices today. You, you chose to get up. You chose to get dressed. You, you, you made a choice of what to wear. Uh, you made a choice to come to church today. Thank you. Uh, the Lord thanks you. And there are many more choices to come today than ahead. And this morning, in the text that we're studying, Jesus is being faced with many choices. Many choices. And we will see through this that Jesus always chooses the Father's will in his timing for all that he does. Jesus was is deliberately moving toward the cross. And in this particular Gospel of John, John doesn't want us to miss the fact that Jesus is heading for the cross. It's very intentional. He has a purpose in mind of what he is to accomplish. And as he moves toward the cross, we see that opposition to Jesus is growing. Opposition from the leading Jews, the chief priests, the scribes and Pharisees, they're leading a, a more and more opposition against him. In fact, uh, they want to kill him. With this in mind, we come to today's text and we see and observe that Jesus desired God's will more than anything else. John tells us that it was the time of the annual Feast of Tabernacles. This was another of these three great annual feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes called the Feast of Booths, because they would build little booths like this. They would build a shelter. They would uh, collect branches of different kinds and they would build a little shelter and then they would stay in it for the length and duration of the feast of seven days. They did this so that they could remember what their ancestors went through when they came out of Egypt. When they were delivered from the bondage in Egypt, they went into the desert and there Moses led them and for 40 years they lived in tents. They lived in temporary housing. So the Feast of Tabernacles was to remember what their ancestors went through and experience it. And this memory also would help them to remember that God is the deliverer. God is the provider. This feast came in the fall. It was sometimes also called the Feast of Ingathering because they had gathered in all their crops. And now they came to the temple and they worshiped God and praised and thanked him for the provision of the crops. And so they stayed in these booths, these little temporary shelters, and they celebrated, they worshiped and thanked God. 
So it was time for the Feast of Tabernacles. And then, then we see that uh, as Jesus, we read in chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus was going around Galilee. He was purposely staying away from Judea because the Jewish leaders there wanted to kill him. And so we're getting near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And as it drew closer and closer to those final days, the leaders were plotting to kill him. Jesus was wisely preparing because he had a purpose of when he was to die and exactly on his terms. Jesus knew there, these leaders were seeking to take his life. So for a season, he stayed in Galilee and he ministered there, waiting for the right time. We read in verses 2 through 4, but when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one wants to become a public figure, acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. You see what Jesus' brothers are doing here? They're, they're tempting him. They're taunting him. They're baiting him. They're saying, go down to Jerusalem. Show yourself. Do some miracles down there. They're taunting him. They're pushing him. Come on, make a show of yourself. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, John reveals this experience with Jesus' brothers, his half-brothers, his siblings, sons of Mary and Joseph, after the holy birth of Jesus. And he had uh, several brothers and sisters. And these brothers were taunting him, challenging them to go make a public show but it was not the right time. You see, at this time, his brothers did not believe in him. Jesus replied, My time was not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not yet going up to the festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. My time has not yet fully come. Jesus rejected their proposal. He said to his brothers, no, this was not the, the right time for Jesus to go and do what they were suggesting to show himself as the Messiah to the crowds of people and to the leadership here. Jesus shows tremendous discernment at this point. You or I, we might have been tempted to follow the advice of these brothers, go down and do it. But it was the wrong time. It was God's plan that Jesus would be sacrificed as the sacrificial lamb at a very specific time in history. He would be at the Passover. That's going to occur six months later in the spring, in the fall of the Feast of Tabernacles, that wasn't the time of the sacrifice. Jesus was the Lamb of God that would be sacrificed at Passover. God had an appointed time and a pathway for Jesus. And this was not the way. What his brothers suggested was not the way. Jesus communicates with his brothers that they're to go. It was their religious duty, it was the religious duty of all Jews to go, and so he tells them, you go, but he was not going, not yet. He was not going to go to them. He was not going to present himself in Jerusalem as the Messiah on this trip. What they were looking for would come later. Six months later, there would be what was called the triumphal entry, and Jesus would ride in on the donkey, and he would present himself as the Messiah, but not yet. The time was not now. Jesus rejects the proposal, and he has a different time for all these things. He has a specific timetable from the Lord, from God the Father, for everything he's doing. He knew the timetable the Heavenly Father had set for him. His brothers could come and go at any time without any significance, but for him, as the Messiah, it was a very proper time. The world was not dangerous to the brothers, they were part of the world at this time. 
But the world hated Jesus, and that means the religious leaders of this world, the enemies of Christ. He was not of the world. He was from the Father. Jesus said he had come into the world as light, and he pointed out men's sins. And because of that, there was animosity for him. But for Jesus, there was a right time when he would present himself in Jerusalem, and that was to come when the Jewish leaders would arrest him, and he would go to the cross. Several times in John's Gospel, he mentions the time. Here, in chapter 2, in chapter 8, he says the time was not yet. The time was not yet. But when we get to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is praying in the Garden, then Jesus said, my time has come. As he prays and asks the Lord for help, Father, the time has come, he would say here in Gethsemane, the time when he would become the sacrificial lamb and go to the cross. What is the lesson of this part of the chapter, the experience here? And I want to suggest this, that real faith does not take presumptive risk. For Jesus to go to Jerusalem the way his brother suggested would without the Father's direction, would have been an act of presumption and not faith. Jesus always was looking to the Father for guidance and direction. He would not move ahead of what the Father desired. I'm reminded of a similar temptation that came to Jesus. We read about it in, earlier in the Gospels, especially in Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus is off in the wilderness and Satan came to him with various tests. And one of those tests was Jesus, he took Jesus to the height of the pinnacle of the temple, the very highest point, and he said to Jesus, throw yourself down so that everybody can see you and your miracles and believe in you. And Jesus said, no. It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. We don't do foolish things that test God that's presumption. Jesus shows us the right way. Jesus had a plan to lay down his life, but it would not be at the Feast of Tabernacles. Rather, it would be at the Passover. When we move by our own initiative and are not living in true submission to the Father and dependence upon the Lord, we take a chance. <laughs> and we don't have the same protection as Jesus went under the direction of what God's leading was, the Father's direction, even when people would come against Jesus, they were not going to be successful because God had a perfect timetable. Time table. And it's the same for us. When we're doing what the Lord asks for us, we're under divine protection. When we step out of that, we lose that divine protection and we're not operating in the walk of obedience. Jesus says here, this is from the Proverbs, actually, Solomon wrote, as we're learning to listen to God and to trust in him, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to him, and he'll make your path straight. And isn't that a beautiful promise, a word from the Lord, that as we submit to him, as we trust in him and don't lean on our own understanding, but listen to what the Lord is leading us, then we will have this promise that he'll make our paths straight. The world did not hate the brothers of Jesus at this time. They were not a part of Jesus' followers yet. Therefore, Jesus said, the world did not hate you, but it hates him, because his life and witnesses and testifies that the works of the world are evil. But here we have this promise, trust in the Lord, lean on him. But what's another beautiful lesson I see here? It's this. Real faith in God submits to God's timing. Amen. His brothers left for the festival, and Jesus also went, but he didn't do so publicly, but in secret. Jesus was still going to be faithful to go to this feast, but he was going to do it under the direction of the Lord, he went discreetly, and he'd only teach when it was the right time, because he was not going to bring about his premature arrest and death. Jesus and the disciples went. They went quietly without fanfare. 
uh, so that he would not be in jeopardy before the appointed time, John tells us the Jewish leaders were watching for him. Notice here, the leaders were looking for him. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus. So all of the Sanhedrin and all of their deputies were out there looking for Jesus in the crowds. And they were saying, where is he? Where is he? And among the crowds, there was widespread whispering. Everybody was looking for Jesus. He's now been to at least six feasts publicly as the revealed Messiah, doing many miracles and healings. And now he's coming to this one, and they're looking for him. And in the crowd, some people were saying, he's a good man. But others were saying, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly because they had fear of the leaders. They didn't want to get in trouble. But everyone was looking for him. Everyone was talking about him quietly under their breath, so to speak. But Jesus was staying out of the public eye early in the festival, waiting, submitting to the timing of the Father. He knew the time, and he was waiting for just the right time to make his appearance. And it says that not until halfway through the festival, so several days of the feasting was going on, halfway through the festival, finally Jesus went out to the temple, and there he began to teach. Now there are crowds and crowds. The temple area is full of people. And the Jews were amazed that they asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus waited for the right time to go up. And he did go up, and he did teach. And the people were in awe. They were in awe of his teaching. And it made people wonder, how did he get such learning? Every time that Jesus taught, people were amazed. And Jesus explained why that is. My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. It was God's teaching. He explained the source of his knowledge and his teaching. It was from the Father. It was from the Father. Real faith, you know, leads to understanding. Jesus explained this, that my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. And anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. You know, as a new believer, the more you read the Word of God, the more you listen to the Word of God, the more it all makes sense to you. Because God enlightens us. And we find out that his teaching does come from God. The Holy Spirit confirms it and reveals it to us. And so Jesus challenges people, believe me, trust in me, then it will be revealed to you. Real faith leads to understanding. We begin to understand it more and more. This that the Father has given through Jesus comes to us and then we understand. The scripture says, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. Jesus explains to the people what the will of God is. The will of God is to believe in the one he sent. To believe in Jesus is the will of God that people would believe in him. And through that faith, they would gain understanding. They would begin to understand what Jesus is saying. Well, the leaders confront Jesus as he begins to teach on that midpoint of the Feast of Tabernacles. And they ask him, has not Moses given you the law? Jesus says, has not Moses given you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? They responded, you are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus confronts the very people who are trying to take his life, especially the religious leaders. He asked the Jewish leaders why they're trying to kill him. They had accused him because he healed on the Sabbath. Time and again, we see these healings that took place, like the man at the pool of Bethesda. That happened on the heel on the Sabbath. And so the spiritual leaders, the scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law said, what are you doing carrying a mat on the Sabbath? And he said, the man who healed me told me to get up carry him back. But Jesus was helping them understand 
that doing good on the Sabbath was not a violation of the Sabbath, only the rules that they made up about the Sabbath. Jesus says in response to their question, I did one miracle, and you're all amazed. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry at me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances. Their argument that Jesus was violating the Sabbath by healing on the Sabbath was such a contradiction. They called it work, and yet it was also work to do the practice of circumcision. And they did that on the Sabbath because the law said they were to circumcise on the eighth day. And if it happened to be the eighth day fell on the Sabbath, well, they had to circumcise because that's what the law said. And you see, they could do that without thinking that was a violation of the law. And Jesus said, you can cut a person on the Sabbath, and that's not a violation of the law. Why is making a person well, healing their whole body? Stop judging by your appearances and judge correctly. Jesus was challenging their thinking. At that, song, at that point, some of the people in Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? There were people in the crowd that knew what the Jews were up to. They knew they were plotting to kill him. And they're asking, isn't this the man up there teaching that they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly and they're not saying a word to him? Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. These are the kind of questions that were coming in the crowd. People were asking lots of questions about him. Everybody was talking about him, thinking about him. He was the source of all the attention. And here they're saying, but we know where he comes from. He's from Galilee. Yeah, they're, they're, they're puzzled. They're puzzled. Jesus responds. Jesus, still teaching in the temple porch, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour, his time, had not yet come. Jesus continues to operate within the timing of God the Father's leaving, and it is time to be arrested had not yet come. The people that were trying to get him tried to right here, but God's protection was over him, and Jesus was able to slip away, and he was not seized because the hour had not come. The people were very divided. Still many in the crowd believed in him, and they said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? For the last two and a half months, we've been looking at all the signs that John has been sharing. All the people saw these signs, and everyone said, could anyone who would be a Messiah do more than what this man has done? Of course not. Well, the Pharisees heard people say this in the crowd, and then they come out and shout out, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. And so they tried to arrest him. They kept trying. Some believed, others rejected. You know, that's the way it is today. We have these incredible evidences of Jesus, and some respond to those and others respond the other way and reject them. Jesus explained it again. He said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Jesus explained to the crowds that he was only going to be with them a little while longer, and he was going away. He was going back to the Father, but they would not find him. He knew his time. He knew the time the Father had sent. But many did not understand what Jesus was saying. They didn't know what he meant by leaving and going back. 
And Jesus takes one more, one more appearance to talk to them. On the very last day of the festival, it says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus came again into the temple courts. And he said in a loud voice this, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. And by this, he meant that the spirit, whom those who believed in him, were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus continued to invite the people to believe in him, to receive in him. And he says again and again, let all you who are thirsty come to me and drink. Some believe, some did not. And here's some lessons from the scripture that I want us to think about and take to heart today. Again, I shared this earlier, real faith does not take presumptuous, presumptuous risk. In Jesus' case, he did not flirt with death. He had no death wish. He shows an exemplary, healthy attitude toward death, ready to take the steps that God had ordered, God's timing, but fully resistant toward any kind of premature death. He did only what the Father directed. You know, and it's our responsibility to resist the presumptuous risk too. It's our responsibility to take care of our spiritual and emotional and physical well-being so that we can finish the course that God has for us. He's given us to run. It is presumptuous to be reckless or negligent in those areas. So may God help you to be wise and also having a healthy attitude in these areas, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. A second one I see here is that real faith submits to God's timing. I titled this about that Jesus knows the time. Just as Jesus waited for God's timing to move and to speak and to listen, he listened for his voice of leading. We too have, must have a listening and be a listening ear, a listening heart, and a willing heart to wait and be obedient to when we hear, hear God's direction and guidance. I put this slide up that I think is so cool. Faith in God includes faith in his timing. This is the right time for things. And finally, this one here. Real faith leads to understanding. Believe in what we read in God's word and responding to it in faith and trusting it leads to further understanding. One builds on the other. And so the more that we trust in him, the more that we believe, the more our eyes open to spiritual truth and understanding. It's not all this. It's kind of contrary. But may the Lord help us to take these truths to heart. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. I thank you for this gospel of John. I thank you for Jesus showing us the wisdom to listen carefully to the Father's leading, to only do those things that we're directed to do, to seek you in all things in prayer. And Lord, help us to, to do just that. I pray for each of us here that we will choose, that we will desire to choose your way, O Lord. To be like Jesus who did not give into temptation to prove himself right and always to be understood, but instead he took the path that was marked out for him. He followed the timing and the ways that the Father led him. Help us, O Lord, to choose your will. Help us to recognize that though it is not always easy, it is always right and true, it will never go wrong when we choose you and to obey you. Now, O oh Lord, may the love of each of us here abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we may be able to discern what is best. And may you uh, pour into us, Holy Spirit, great, a great infusion that we will be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness that come through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen. I invite you